When you look up the facts on Lou Gehrig's disease, also known as ALS, it can seem and feel hopeless at times. But coming up today, we are pulling the grim curtain back and discovering people who are living with it, gone through it, and are hearing overwhelming hope for a possible cure. That's coming up. The Whitney Reynolds Show was made possible by Theraderm. We believe that every person should have the opportunity to look as refreshed, young, and healthy as absolutely possible. Children's Learning Place, excellence in early childhood education since 1998. Sharp Vision Modern LASIK, believing is seeing. Cyton, because results matter. Fresh Dental, keeping smiles fresh. And Kevin Kelly with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty. Luxury is an experience, not a price point. And by other sponsors, Hollis Plyman and Company, CPA firm. The Cryo Bar. Cellular Intelligence. Tutu School of Chicago Land. Deluxe Cleaning Services. Chicago Andrea Creative. Goldfish Swim Schools of Chicago Land. Barkbusters Home Dog Training. Instagram My Selfie. And Export Fitness. ALS hit a lot of our radars after the ice bucket challenge went viral. More than likely, you saw the challenge video or even created one. But how much do you really know about the disease behind it all? Today, we are looking at a day in the life of people dealing with ALS. You're watching The Whitney Reynolds Show. ALS, also known as Lou Gehrig's disease, hit the radar of millions a few years ago during the viral ice bucket challenge. But do you really know what the chilling details are behind the disease? To help us better understand, we have a doctor joining us on set. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So today we're talking about Lou Gehrig's disease, and I just want to kick things off with kind of the perspective of what medically this is like. So uh, Lou Gehrig's disease, it's also known as motor neuron disease, also known as ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, is a disease we've known about for at least 150 years. It was originally described by a French neurologist named Charcot. And in France, it's known as Charcot's disease. It's a disease where a select population of nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord degenerate and leads to progressive weakness. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's an unusual disorder. There aren't a lot of individuals. It's like one or two per 100,000. Generally speaking, it does not run in families. It just seems to arise out of it for no clear reason. And it leads to progressive weakness, and it makes it increasingly difficult for people to speak and to swallow and to breathe. Mm. And you said it starts with the nerves? Right. So there's one nerve cell that's connected to muscles. That's the motor neuron. And then there's a nerve cell in the brain that tells the motor neuron what to do. It's the instructor. And in this disease, both the upper motor neuron, the instructor, and the lower motor neuron, the nerve cell that's connected to muscle, degenerate. How did you end up finding this kind of as your specialty? I'd say it's mostly serendipity. Um, I was working in the lab and it happened that I was um, studying motor neurons for a different reason. And uh, I discovered it was quite easy to kill them. And so then I figured, well, as long as I'm very good at killing them, I might as well be studying a disease where they die. And that was 25 years later, I'm still at it. Wow, well, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge. It's a pleasure, thank you very much. Our next two guests are battling ALS as a team. After meeting on the Obama campaign, getting married and starting a family, they are not letting this disease stop them from living and loving their future together. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having us. 
Ryan, when were you diagnosed with ALS? So I was officially diagnosed in November 2017. When that happened, Sandra, what, what were some of the signs that you saw as the spouse? Yeah, I mean, it's amazing because I'm a hypochondriac, but Brian talking about, oh, my left hand feels a little bit weaker or my left arm feels a little bit um, like weaker. It just, that didn't strike me as worrisome. And that's very atypical for me. Um, the reason he ended up going to the doctor is because he actually had a really persistent cough. Mm -hmm. And so when he went in for, you know, the cough, and then talked about other things happening, like the weakness in his left hand and arm, that's when the doctor suggested that he go see a neurologist. And at that point, did you connect any dots to potentially being ALS? I mean, at that point, no, because what you see with ALS is progression takes place over time. So the impact you hear in my voice, the impact you see in my hands, that didn't occur for a year. Mm -hmm. So for the first six months to a year, people would see me and I looked absolutely normal. And so that's part of the difficulty with ALS is that when you're first in the fight, things look and feel normal and then over time, everything changes. Mm -hmm. So when you went to the neurologist, did he just run a series of tests and then you left knowing the diagnosis? So the first neurologist uh, sat me down after 10 minutes and said, I'm 99% sure you have ALS. <sighs> and we discovered after that 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 was probably premature to say that because what you actually have to do is you have to exclude everything else. You have to test for HIV, you have to test for cancer, test for autoimmune diseases. Then once those come back as a no, mm -hmm. then you can look at this and say, okay, the last thing we have left is ALS. So when you found out that you did have ALS, what was what was the first feeling for you? I, mean, I know it's not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was um, unreal, and I didn't know anything about ALS, and Brian first said it to me in the car when he drove back home from that neurologist appointment and said, you know, things are not okay, and I was panicking, and he told me that this doctor said that he's 99% certain that Brian has ALS, and frankly, at first, I, I like felt relieved because I thought, oh, isn't that like a chronic disease that you can live with? Like it, mm. I, th I thought about the ice bucket challenge and then I thought like, oh, didn't we like make a lot of strides and figure that out? And okay, that's hard, but we're going to figure it out. And Brian's like, actually, no, um, it's a terminal illness right now. Mm. And this doctor at the time gave us some misinformation, which is that he said, it, Brian, it's possible that you have six months to live. Mm. Um, in reality, after diagnosis, patients typically live two to five years, but either way, very difficult news. And that was the day we brought our second daughter home from the hospital after giving birth. And so we had mm -hmm. in the house a six-day-old baby and a two-year-old. And for you, and he told you that, did he walk you through what ALS meant or did you already know? So he didn't really. Uh, he sat my dad and said, do you know what ALS is? And I said, I know that Lou Gary had it. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then I said, but beyond that, I don't know what this really means. And that's when he said, well, what it means is there is no cure. And people can pass away as soon as six months after they're diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And so we had this kind of surreal moment. I'm sure you've had days like this in your life where you start the day on a, such a high, you know, we're bringing our daughter home and then I remember walking out of the doctor's office thinking, is this real? Like, uh, how does this happen? Right. And how did you cope in that moment? Was it immediately like fight or flight? Like, I'm going to help move the dial forward? So I would love to say that I had that immediate reaction. I, I didn't. <clears throat> I actually buried myself from work. I was a federal prosecutor at the time, and I had a couple of trials coming up. So... Part of what helped me kind of restore my life was going back to the things that made you feel normal. And as we're working through that as a family, as we're trying to see what we can do to actually treat this thing and see if we can find a way to actually accelerate the fight, that's when we started thinking about, could we do more? Mm -hmm. Is there more that we can do given who we are, given what we've been lucky enough to be a part of and what we could bring to the fight? How long did it take you to get to that point to say, let's start something that's bigger than us? 
Well, <laughs> I have started a couple of nonprofits um, in the education space and so know how hard it is. And Brian obviously also knew how hard it was as my spouse helping me start these two nonprofits. So basically six months after diagnosis, Brian started to fly around the country and try to figure out like, what is missing? Why is this not moving at the pace that we needed to move in spite of like all the progress that's been made? How do we make it go faster? And how can we help? And when he talked about the idea of launching another nonprofit, I was like, oh, <laughs> like, right. you know, that is so much work. It is so hard. Um, and on top of what we're dealing with, like, is that the right thing for us? But ultimately, the more we learned, the more it made sense. What did you discover? Because that was an interesting thing that you just said. That you were flying out to try to understand why why it's not going further. Like what's happening? What did you discover? So uh, I think the big takeaway was there are a lot of amazing people doing a lot of things, <clears throat> but when you look at the rate of progress in the ALS space, really the last five years have been a lot of progress, and before that there wasn't that much. Mm. And so what you had was you had this explosion of groups that were trying to do amazing things, but there was no real infrastructure. There was no capacity to tell the world what we actually were achieving. And so we looked at that and said, okay, two things that we're good at are actually organizing movements. We met on the Obama campaign in 08, and we're good at actually telling a story. And so the question that we started to ask was, could we find a way to kind of bring patients into a leadership role, bring mm -hmm. their story to the world and say, look, we have a chance here to remake not just the ALS story, but every other disease that's connected to it, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, and beyond. And so that for us was the moment where I finally convinced Sandra to allow me to dive into this, and <laughs> we launched IM ALS earlier this year. Wow. And with that, tell us about I what's the mission? I know you just said about yeah. connecting people <clears throat> with stories, but like, what is... What is the goal yeah. for y'all to accomplish with this? So I, I think the ultimate goal is to end ALS. Um, that is easy to say. Every nonprofit out there, every doctor out there shares that goal. For us, the, the key metrics are how do we accelerate that ending to be as soon as possible? Mm. So how do we get more research funding into the fight? Mm -hmm. How do we get people that are living with ALS access to treatments they need right now mm -hmm. so they can become activists that help lead this fight. And I really make people that are not involved in the fight aware of what we're doing and want to be a part of it. And with the drugs, because you just mentioned something, how does the drug market work for ALS right now? So right now, it's pretty sparse. And, and that is one of the things that we're trying to change. The good news is, if you look back 10 years ago, there were two drugs that people were developing to treat ALS. There are now 35. So oh, the pipeline is huge, okay. and that means that the opportunity is huge. The question is, can we make people focus on that? And can we realize that the chance to actually change this thing is not ephemeral? It's a question of not if, but when. Have you found comfort as you've been walking through this journey with the IMALS group that now you're hearing their stories? Yeah, I mean... I am so proud of the fact that IMALS is centered on this idea of patient-led movement work, right? That's just like the ethos of IMALS that makes this work so powerful. We don't care who finds a cure. You're a patient and you just want a cure. So you're willing to break some rules. You're willing to move faster. You're willing to do things differently in an out-of-the-box way when you're literally fighting for your life. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just feel so fortunate to be surrounded by this community of patients who, with the support that IMALS provides, feel like they have more tools to mobilize, to become a part of this organizing community right. that is now coalescing. And Brian, do you, do you see it as a death sentence or since you have been going through this and developing IMALS, do you see it as that or do you see the opportunity for like, no, we can, we can do this? I think I, I've taken describing ALS as a currently terminal illness. And what I mean by that is, mm -hmm. today it will kill me, but that does not have to be our future. Mm -hmm. and so what is so amazing about what Sandra just mentioned is, is that we have a patient advisory committee of over 80 patients and caregivers that are working every day as volunteers, because they believe that the actual chance to make the currently terminal into a currently chronic illness is a real thing. 
So for your family, you do look at it as a terminal illness. You balance the two, right? Mm -hmm. It's hard. You balance the possibility mm -hmm. that it will continue to be terminal, but you wake up every morning and you activate grounded in the belief mm -hmm. that you can make it chronic. Right. And so we both feel authentically grounded in that hope because this is the moment and it isn't about if we're going to cure ALS. It's about when we're going to cure ALS. And it's about whether we and this coalition can expedite that, you know, race for a cure to make a difference in our own lifetime and with those patients who are alive now fighting it. Yeah. And I think a big part of it is that we want to build the movement that everyone feels like they can be a part of. So there is no one who can't be a part of this, whether you're a patient, whether you're a caregiver, whether you've never met anyone but they are also also us. I know the key is we are in this together. Yeah. We all carry burdens. And so that is part of what we're trying to do is we're trying to find a way to meet people where they are find out what their burden is and find a way to alleviate that so that they realize that they are going to be alive today and tomorrow and that if they want to, they can use that time to make a difference. And what's been so incredible is all the people that we've met who've left at that chance, who actually are outstripping me as leaders in the community who are doing amazing things and changing the world every day. It's a truly humbling and amazing thing. Do you know that you're incredible? Like, do you know that? I just Stop. like, I know. <laughs> don't listen. I am, don't listen. Yeah, I am. I'm just in awe of like what you two have done together and that there's, you know, and there's very, I don't want to say few people, but that can take something that is like life altering and really say, I am going to do everything in my power to help the next people that could face this. And that's what you're doing. Well, I, I think what has been truly amazing is that actually a lot of people, the question is, do they have the chance to do it? Everyone has that capacity. We just get obviously distracted with our lives. And so when we actually apply ourselves, there are amazing things we can do. I mean, we, you know, gone to the moon. We almost cured HIV. We've done so much. This is the next big thing. That is such a great reminder. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, you for too. having us with me. Last but not least, we wanted to leave you with hope and love. In fact, this couple founded Love Hopes Camp, an ALS camp for kids impacted by this disease. Not only is their camp one of a kind, but so is their love story. They met after losing their spouses to ALS. Let's take a look. So today we've been talking about ALS and how it goes beyond the ice bucket challenge. And this is a reality that so many people face. And when they do find out they have ALS, there's, you know, a lot of confusion. There's a lot of questions that go on. And both of you actually face this disease firsthand. Tell us about your story. So my story is in 1995, my late husband, Kevin Gerard O'Donnell was diagnosed. He was 30 years old. We had a two-year-old at home. I was 29 and... We truly didn't know a lot about ALS. We knew very little, and I had no idea what was in store for us. And Bitten, you have a very ser like very similar story whenever it comes to this as well. Uh, yes, we, my my wife was uh, 39 when she was diagnosed, um, and that was in 1999. So our progression was um, slower and uh, later in 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 years. And we had a seven year old and a nine year old at the time. So when you found out your spouses were diagnosed, did you have a hope in that moment or was it, was it kind of despair? What was that feeling? I always held on to hope. Um, and, and I think that having hope in any circumstance, um, difficult circumstance is key to just um, finding blessings in each day. And even though it may be challenging and ultimately um a major loss in your life, living in hope and, and containing that brings more joy. That is so that's good stuff right there. I'm glad you brought out the hope and the joy factor because, you know, there is a lot of confusion with ALS and, you know, kind of the track of what it will look like, but it's amazing that you discovered hope. And that's my next point with your story is your story. The ALS journey didn't just stop there. Tell us about actually meeting. How did you guys meet? Because they're now married. I mean, this is amazing. So tell us about that. It is really, it's a great story. Um, so 
Kevin passed away sadly in 2001 and our daughter Elena was eight years old. And I, I remember I, I was so used to not sleeping and so used to caring and making a difference that I completely felt like I had no idea how to go on. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out like at two in the morning and said, please, someone hire me. And I um, got a job as director of communications with the ALS Hope Foundation in Philadelphia and immediately um, was a part of a wonderful event, which was a family fun day and a fall festival for those families affected by ALS. And my mom, of all people, found this article about a book that was published by Tina Singer Ames. The book was called, What Did You Learn Today? And she said, you know, you should check this book out. And I ordered 50 copies. And because my husband is so thrifty, <laughs> he decided that his late wife wrote the book and he didn't want to ship them and pay for the shipping. So he and his two children, Nora and Adam, um, all came to this event and I brought our my daughter, Alina, and also my um, niece, Raquel, and we met at this event and we became friends through Tina's book. Oh, that is beautiful. I mean, that's one of the things, and this is what we're big on with the show, is that you realize that you're not that much different from other people because we all have something going on. It might not be the exact same journey, but we all have something. And with that, was that kind of the connecting that you both were able to honor your own journeys and then come together? And now you've created something even bigger for ALS. So I think it was really important for us from the start to recognize that we were um, we we were widowed. We lost our spouses, and we wanted to honor them moving forward in life. We wanted to respect our journey, um, grieve when we're grieving. Even you know to this day, there are days that we both grieve our spouses, um, and that's okay. And but also. Um, keep their memories alive in a really positive way, the way that they were. They mm -hmm. were fun and energetic and heroic and kind and compassionate. And it was our role, not only for us, but for our children to continue that, um, those positive and life-changing journeys. And in their honor. In their honor. <laughs> and that's what you're here doing now. You're actually in Chicago hosting a kids camp. Tell us about the camp. Um, the camps that we run are basically, they're generally weekend camps, uh, they're stay away camps, and our mission is to have the kids be in a safe, um, fun, nurturing, understanding environment where they can talk with other kids and other families that are in exactly the same situation that they are, because it, it, the disease is rare enough that the chances of finding someone who understands exactly what you're going through at home is is almost zero and they are going through some things at home that mo almost no other kids will go through and most other adults are, uh, are lucky enough not to go through so just putting them in, the, in an environment where they can a just be kids and b share stories and and not have to explain what's going on at home is is a huge benefit now where can people find out about you guys because it's really you have a book that came out i mean this is amazing journey of turning tragedy into a story that doesn't end there so tell us about that. so www.hopelovescompany.org we are on twitter facebook um instagram i don't do that so well but Thank goodness we have somebody who can help. And um, truly, we learned so much more from the families who last uh, month we were in Massachusetts with 100 people. And we learned so much more from the families that we meet and spend the weekend with than we can ever provide. So it's just, it's a, it's a joy and a blessing to be able to do this work. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having us. We appreciate it. In this lifetime, someone you know or love might develop this disease. But what we found out today is the hope and knowledge base is growing by the day. Remember, your story matters. For more information on today's show, visit WhitneyReynolds.com. Go beyond the interview with Whitney Reynolds' 52-week guide of inspiration. The book goes deeper with the topics you see on The Whitney Reynolds Show. To get your copy for $12.95 plus shipping and handling, go to WhitneyReynolds.com backslash store and use code PBS. The Whitney Reynolds Show was made possible by Theraderm, 
We believe that every person should have the opportunity to look as refreshed, young, and healthy as absolutely possible. Children's Learning Place, excellence in early childhood education since 1998. Sharp Vision Modern LASIK, believing is seeing. Cyton, because results matter. Fresh Dental, keeping smiles fresh. And Kevin Kelly with Jameson Sotheby's International Realty. Luxury is an experience, not a price point. And by other sponsors, Hollis Plyman and Company, CPA Firm. The Cryo Bar. Cellular Intelligence. Tutu School of Chicago Land. Deluxe Cleaning Services. Chicago Andrea Creative. Goldfish Swim Schools of Chicago Land. Bark Busters Home Dog Training. Instagram My Selfie. And Export Fitness.